Have you ever wondered why black Americans vote so heavily Democratic? Well, from 1877 to 1960, the Democratic Party held a virtually unchallenged grip on the politics of the South in a period known as the Solid South. This control would begin to loosen as the Democratic Party would gradually shift its position on black civil rights. 1964 to 1994, the South underwent a gradual transition from the Democratic Party to a Republican stronghold. Democrats and Republicans in the past were not as ideologically unified as they appear today. There was a time when there were conservative Democrats, especially in the South, and liberal Republicans. During the 1930s, Franklin Roosevelt created the New Deal Coalition in its efforts to combat the Great Depression, unifying labor unions, rural Southerners, and different minority groups under a collective force to support his agenda. His administration even recruited some liberal Republicans to that coalition, resulting in the formation of the Black Cabinet, which was a group of black leaders who served as policy advisors to the president. Simultaneously, a conservative coalition emerged, consisting of conservative Democrats, especially in the South, and some conservative Republicans. These two coalitions remained active into the 1960s, prompting some Southern Democrats to switch over to the Republican Party. This dynamic led to a more progressive Democratic establishment in conflict with the conservative Southern voting bloc in matters such as race and social welfare. After the 1948 presidential election, President Harry Truman made an explicit appeal to new civil rights measures before Congress, including voting rights protections, a federal ban on lynching, and bolstering civil rights laws. Because of this, he faced a break from Southern Democrats who formed a state's right Democratic Party under Southern Governor Strom Thurmond. Strom Thurmond's ticket won almost a million votes and 39 electoral votes taken in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and South Carolina. Nonetheless, Harry Truman was successful in winning the election with 77% of the black vote and the number of African Americans identifying as Democrats would progressively increase. This surge of black solidarity for the Democratic Party led to an electoral advantage for the party and the implementation of racially progressive policies. This shift caused white segregationists to consider a third party presidential bid, indicating they were searching for a new political home. This exhibited some of the first major weakenings of the Solid South, and in the 1952 and 1956 election, Dwight Eisenhower's GOP began to make further inroads into the South. Southern Democrats were instrumental in the segregationist movement opposing black civil rights during this period. Virginia Governor Harry Byrd established a massive resistance campaign to combat school desegregation, and 99 Southern Democrats endorsed the Declaration of Constitutional Principles that was the Southern Manifesto, an objection to desegregation initiative. Strom Thurmond ran an individual filibuster of the 1957 Civil Rights Act, which lasted over 24 hours, and notable segregationist figures such as George Wallace of Alabama and Ross Barnett were both Southern governors. During the 1960 election, Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy had similar perspectives on civil rights. Nixon garnered almost a third of the African-American vote, but it's important to realize that majority of African-Americans resided in the South where they could not exercise their right to vote. Also during the 1960 election, frustrated Southern electors from 14 states that had cast their ballots for John F. Kennedy during the presidential election declined to cast their vote for him, instead voting for Harry Byrd, who wasn't even a candidate. This election marked the last time a presidential candidate was able to receive more than 15 percent of the African-American vote. In 1968, the presidential election saw another major shift into the South as the region continued to abandon the Democratic Party. Only Texas, the home state of Democratic nominee Hubert Humphrey, voted for him in this election. George Wallace, running on a campaign of only white supremacy for the American Independent Party, was successful in gaining 10 million votes and 46 electoral votes in five southern states. Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. After 1968, the South would continue to support Republican candidates voting for Richard Nixon in 1972, Ronald Reagan in 1980 and 1984, and Bush in 1988. Meanwhile, African Americans were already heavily voting for Democrats. At no point after 1936 did a Republican candidate get more than 45% of the black vote. The GOP would then employ the Southern strategy to capitalize on racial tensions and gain a crucial foothold in the South. This strategy, developed by political strategist Kevin Phillips, 
and implemented in Richard Nixon's election campaign in 1968 and 1972. See, in 1965, the enfranchisement of black voters in the South and the strong support of the Democratic Party caused conservative white Southerners to lean even further towards the Republican Party. Additionally, the party began to use coded language such as law and order and states' rights to target conservative white Southerners who were resentful of the racial integration and fearful of urban unrest. Despite this, many Southern Democrats still won state and congressional elections, most significantly Lester Maddox's election for governor in Georgia in 1966. However, the progressive and multiracial Democratic Party establishment, coupled with the successes of Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan's administration, gradually moved conservative politicians in the South more towards the Republican Party. This all culminated in the Republican Revolution in 1994 when the South became a firmly Republican region. Meanwhile, the Democratic Party strengthened its bond with the black voters, leading to groundbreaking establishments such as the election of Douglas Wilder as the first black governor in the United States. Even Jesse Jackson's two unsuccessful presidential campaigns in 1984 and 1988 were instrumental in producing the necessary amendments to the Democratic Party's platform, further increasing the number of black representatives, mayors, and other elected officials. As a result of all of this, Identity politics has now become fully entangled with partisanship. The Republican Party is now attracting more white voters than ever, while black voters have become increasingly connected to the Democratic Party. What if I told you the story about how these two actually became friends? Well, in September 4th, 1957, nine black students were attempting to integrate Little Rock Central High School. They were known as the Little Rock Nine. One of those students was Elizabeth Eckford. Elizabeth Eckford at the time did not have a house phone, so she wasn't aware of the other eight students' plans to enter on the other side of the school with an escort of ministers. So she entered on the wrong side of the school and had to walk in alone. During that time, a group of white students surrounded her as she was walking in and began screaming, 2468, we don't want to integrate. One of those students being Hazel Bryant, who was reporting a screaming at effort, go home, Negro, go back to Africa. After this happened, she received a lot of critical hate mail. Thus, her parents removed Hazel Bryant from the school. After this time, she felt guilty of her treatment of effort and had changed her mind on integration and attempted to apologize to her in 1964. They would not meet again until 1997, which commemorated the 40th anniversary of Central Little Rock High School's integration. During that time, they actually became friends. They would off, they would go do activities together and even did a few documentaries. This all ended in 1999 because as Elizabeth Eckford would put it, Hazel Bryant wanted her to be able to move on from her past and basically wanted to not be responsible for the incident that happened on that day. And Elizabeth Eckford simply couldn't put this behind her. This has been One Mike Black History. I'm your host, Country Boy. And if you'd like to ask a question about black history, you can do so at onemikehistory.com in the contacts page. Thank you for listening and peace.